Father God, thank you for the opportunity this morning to come and celebrate the greatest news of all. Thank you for the cross, but thank you for the resurrection that makes hope possible. Thank you, Lord, that we gather as a church family and we're so diverse and different and cultures and age and styles and but, Lord, something brings us together and unites us when we gather around the cross. And today I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak deeply into our lives and remind us of what matters most. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Children, please would you uh, leave and go to your children's program. And... Thank you, team, this morning. That was absolutely awesome. Wasn't it awesome? The, the, the... I, I'm just amazed at what a talented music team you have. A bunch of people. It's just, it's just, a, just incredible. And uh, they help us. They help us worship. They help us release our, our expressions of praise to God. Well, just a couple of practical things before I share God's word with you today. Um, after last week's message, when I shared the message, the essential message of the book of Acts, I became aware of something and I wrote a, an email to the elders during the week. And it's very difficult to put into words, but I felt like we so often come to church and we sing and celebrate and hear the word of God and then we go home. And we very infrequently give God some space to actually visit with us and, and give an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to, to work in us and through us and hear, this, hear some of the what's God doing in our midst from one another. And it's a very awkward issue because sometimes when we do that, we, we give opportunity for the inappropriate to happen as well as the appropriate. You know, it's a, it's a dangerous thing. It's an edgy thing. And so it, we tend to pull back from the edge because it's safer to organize and plan everything. And I became aware last week when I shared that message of the Acts of the Apostles that one of the things that was so powerful among the church was that they just came and told the story of what God was doing in their midst. And, and, and more people wanted to hear that and join in on it. And I was kind of thinking, what say over the next few weeks, at the end of the service, after we've worshipped and had the message, we just give some time and space for the Holy Spirit to move among us and, to, and, and hear some of the stories. Maybe there's some people who really need to share what God's done during the week. Maybe some opportunities that we've had to share Jesus with people. Maybe we need to spend some time interceding and praying for the future of our church. I don't know. There, there's a whole range of possibilities. But I, and I, I said to the elders, look, I'm happy not to do this. Um, I'm happy for you to wait until the new pastor comes and, and you know, he can do all this kind of stuff. I'll, I'll just kind of, you know, do what I do. You know. But I really felt, no, we need to start. And um, so starting next week, um, and this is going to be edgy, all right? So... This is not comfortable. This is not, this is not, and this is not an opportunity for those of you who have said, I'm just waiting for an opportunity to speak. I've got this 25-minute thing I need to deliver. No, no, this is not you, all right? This is, this is listening to the Spirit of God and responding and having an opportunity to respond at the moment to what God is saying. This is not for you to deliver your message that you've been waiting for an opportunity to Okay, so that's one thing. Um, that's probably the main thing I want to share. All right, so Easter Sunday. Here's the message. And you know, uh, essentially, the disciples really didn't know what they were doing. If you, if you read the book of Acts, one of the things that, that, that comes home to you is that these guys, these guys really didn't have a big plan of what was going on. They told the story. They just kept telling the story, and the more they did it, the more they got into trouble, right? So they go out there, and they tell the story of, he's risen, and, and, and this is what's happened. And they gather together, and the church 
gathers and they have fellowship and break bread and, and, and celebrate the Lord's Supper and give generously to one another. And all this stuff happens and they don't plan any of it because so much of it is unplanned. And, and this is kind of what I'm trying to say about, about how you can, you can plan God out of your lives, but it's very difficult to kind of make him do his stuff because he has to do it. We're going to read together the Easter story, first of all. And it's the story that Luke declares, and uh, I want to just read that for you this morning uh, as, we, as we begin. It's found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and uh, you can just listen, and there'll be a couple of slides that come up. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but didn't find a body, the body of the Lord Jesus. And as they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. And the women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And the men said, why are you looking for the dead, for someone who is alive, among the dead, for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He's risen. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day? Then they remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe. You got it? The men missed it. However, Peter jumped up and he ran to the tomb and he looked in and stooping, he peered and saw the empty linen wrappings and he went home again wondering what had happened. Luke chapter 24, 1 to 12. What struck me as I said about Acts last week was the simplicity of the job description given to the disciples. Essentially, it was go and tell the story. And as you go doing this, the Holy Spirit will confirm your message of good news by signs that God is among you. And they did. And he did. And that was the beginning of the church, telling the story of Jesus, telling the story of the death, resurrection, and the life, and maybe this week's news. What's God done among us? And they began to tell the story. And the more they did, the more people were puzzled and excited and they embraced faith. And there was a mixture of responses. Some people got angry. Some of them got into trouble. Some were thrown in prison. Go and tell the story. I wonder if I was to ask you the question, what happens at Easter time? Or what is the Easter story? What would some of you say? And I'm going to hazard a guess, that many of you would say, Jesus died on the cross for my sin. True. But in fact, it's only half the story. That isn't the Easter story. The Easter story is that he rose again. That's the Easter story. It's the completion of the sentence. The resurrection is the main event of Easter. As much as the cross is central to our faith, it is the resurrection which gives pivotal hope and guarantees our liftoff to new life. It is the resurrection that breaks the power of death. It is the resurrection that enables us to live now with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is the resurrection that sealed the fate of Satan and the demonic realm. It is the resurrection that authenticates, got that? Authenticates Jesus' claim to be the Son of God. Without the resurrection, the claim isn't authenticated. 
It's the resurrection which is the turnkey moment in history. It's the resurrection that is the message. So, friends, I know, I know we get very focused on the cross, and, and rightly so. There was a, an amazing experience, and, it, and it, you can't have a resurrection without a death, right? So the cross is important, but it's only half the story. Friday, but Sunday's coming. Sunday is the story. For the resurrection, if it's not true, that everything Jesus taught crumbles. It's an all or nothing showstopper. Most of you are breathing right at the moment. Uh, <laughs> you're alive, but I want to tell you also that you're dying as well. All right? Some parts of you are more alive than others, and some parts of you are dying right as we speak. Your body does what's medically called atrophies right? Which means that parts of our body start dying from the moment we're born. We are made and we are remade and renewed constantly. Did you know that your lungs are about six weeks old? How about that? Uh, your taste buds are just 10 days old. So how old is the rest of your body? My good question. Many people fret about aging and they realize that whatever your age and years, some parts of your body are just a few days or a few weeks old. Your liver cells only have a lifespan of about 150 days. You can take 70% of a person's liver away in an operation and about 90% of it will grow back within two months. Isn't that incredible? How old are you? Well, actually, I'm a mixture. <laughs> Some parts of me are old and other parts aren't. Some parts of me are just 10 days old. Your brain, by the way, is as old as you are. All 100 billion cells of it. Your heart renews itself about four times over your life. And as I said, your lungs renew constantly. Speaking medically, parts of you are older than other parts. But atrophy, which is the, pla the, the, the dying of you, all right, is something that's going to happen to us all. There will come a time when you will atrophy the whole lot of you. <laughs> and, and you're gone, basically. It doesn't stop renewing anymore. And, and that happens in different ways to different many of us. Friends, there's a part of you that will never die. Did you know that? There's a part of you that doesn't atrophy, and that part is your spirit. That is the spiritual component which God has built into every one of us that lives forever. And that does never die, and that's what goes to be with God. Your body dies. Your body is atrophying right now as we sit here. But one day, you will live forever. Have you noticed how closer to death people come, the more they talk about resurrection. Have you noticed that? The more our bodies atrophy, the more resurrection becomes real to us. And what Jesus did in the resurrection was show us what one day we will all receive. You got that? So he is kind of like a, the first model or the first example or the number one opportunity to show us what a resurrected body looks like, like a, a physical body resurrected for all eternity for life. I want to read to you something that came to me this week. It's from my colleague Larry Crabb, and as many of you know, he passed away to glory some weeks ago now. But he wrote his final journal, and Larry has a great brain. He's written many, many books, uh, most, many about counseling and healing and various, various things. But he was dying. He's had cancer for many years, and he's got a number of physical problems, neuropathy, he has uh, um, diabetes, and so on and so on. And over the years, he's prayed for God to heal him, as, as have many thousands of people around the world. But his body was atrophying, you see? And as it happened more and more, he became to realize that he was not going to get healed. And he writes his journal, and in the final few days of his life, this is what, have, you ever, have you ever been with someone when they're dying, right in the last day or two, and, and talk with them? Incredible. This is, this is, and this is pretty powerful stuff and pretty raw as well. This comes from his son who says, Larry's handwriting was already brutal to read. 
But now, later in his journaling, it is really, really a challenge. My mum will love this one, he writes. Larry says, I'm weak beyond description. Reaching for a pen seems like a terrible chore. Yet I'm comfortable. Not at all depressed, just eager for heaven. I'm feeling more certain about heaven when I die. It is strange that I can't imagine what heaven will be like. I suppose it's intended to be beyond my fondest or wildest imagination, of which I have little, maybe none. A new body is promised. That sounds wonderful. Come back, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. Spare me death. Come back. If not, death sounds wonderful. I am surrounded by my family. That element could not be better. He writes on other occasions about, about his feelings and about his expectation of heaven. And it's just fantastic to, to see some, a believer die and write about his experience just a few days before he's so weak he can't even lift a pen. A great writer. Resurrection. Resurrection. The hope of a body resurrected to new life. The four Gospels record the events of those who follow Jesus. What is clear from the reading of the Bible is that the early believers state everything on the resurrection of Jesus. It wasn't just a novel add-on to the end of his life, as though Jesus lived this great life. He was a wonderful teacher. He did so many good miracles. And by the way, did you happen to know that he kind of finished well? It was quite stunning the way he finished his life, wasn't it? You know, it, it's not like that at all. It's not like that. The resurrection was the reason that God displayed this incredible power to show us that hope and life is possible beyond death. Paul writes later, if Christ had not been resurrected and raised, your faith is in vain. It stands or falls all on this event. And this is why today and celebrating the resurrection is such a wonderful event, such a wonderful celebration to remind ourselves. But those who met the risen Christ were quite fearful, thinking that they had seen a ghost. They can't actually grasp that he's alive again. So if you read the stories, they're kind of pretty bizarre. They're really weird stories. It's almost like after attending a funeral, you answer the door and the person's there in front of you saying, I'm back. I mean, how do you go? How, how would you cope with that? And, and this, is, this is the reality for even the believers of whom they, Jesus told them this would happen, and they go, well, it must be a ghost. Can't be you. In his book, Who Moved the Stone, uh, Howard, Howard Morrison, I was going to say, <laughs> Frank Morrison, Howard Morrison, set out to prove the resurrection was a myth or a hoax. He proposed that the disciples so desperately wanted to believe it was true, they conspired together to make the story up and manipulate the events to appear so. So uh, Mr. Morrison, shall we call him, Frank Morrison, <laughs> Uh, embarks upon this amazing research to find out what really happened in the resurrection. He's not a believer. In fact, he's a, he's, a, he's a complete unbeliever, an atheist. That the disciples stole the body attributes far much too bravery to these terrified deserters. Locked and hiding in an upper room, nothing else can explain the remarkable change in them from the fearful wannabes who would not even bury the body. They sent the woman off to do that. <laughs> what changed these fearful followers to become bold and courageous martyrs for the kingdom? Only the resurrection of the risen Christ can explain adequately. So let's look briefly at four stories of four people who encountered Jesus. Firstly, Mary, from grief to hope. Mary's perhaps the most well-known because, as I read in Luke's gospel, she was first to the morning tomb. She gets there and she, she kind of says, who's going to roll away the stone? And she is amazed that the stone's rolled away and she goes inside and looks and sees an angel, you know. And, and, and then she gets such a shock, she runs outside and she sees someone who she poses as the gardener. And what happens? He says what to her? Her name. He said, Mary. 
And at that moment, hope was born in her. And my question to you today is, as Jesus put to Mary, have you heard him say your name? Because when you're grieving and you've lost hope and you're suffering as a result of how Mary must have felt seeing Jesus die on the cross, hearing him say her name, Mary, hope was born in her. So I'm a question to you this morning. Have you heard God call your name? Fair question. Because he does. At times of grief and loss, he calls us by name. And in that moment, our lives are changed. And the risen Christ can and does heal the brokenhearted. And Mary knew that. Second story. Peter and the other disciple run to the run upon hearing that Jesus has risen, run to the tomb and ste- stoop and look inside. And at that moment, of course, Peter, it says Peter believed. At that moment. I don't know what it was. But Peter's carrying a story inside him, which is hurting. You see, Peter has just denied Jesus. Remember what happened the night when he was betrayed in the courtyard? Three times he said, I don't even know the man. And so he's carrying within his life this sense of failure. And it said, when Peter looked down into the tomb, he saw and he believed. But his belief didn't go far. It's not long before Peter goes, oh, I I don't know, I'm just going fishing. And so he goes off back to fishing, and John 21 tells the story of what happened. He goes fishing again, and you read the story. Jesus appears on the beach. Have you caught any fish? No, it's been hard and tough. And of course, Peter recognizes Jesus and he jumps into the water and swims to shore. And of course, here's the interaction of someone who's denied and failed. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you really? Yes. Three times he asks him, do you love me? One for each of the denials. Maybe for you, Resurrection Sunday is a day for you to hear Jesus say to you, do you love me? But Lord, you don't know what I've done. I've I've, I've failed you and I've run away and I'm ashamed. Do you love me? But Lord, Lord, I'm I'm carrying this this history and I'm carrying this secret thing that that no one knows and I've, do you love me? Maybe for you this morning, Easter Sunday, today is an opportunity for you to hear the Savior, Lord Jesus, say to you, feed my sheep, serve me, follow me, come follow me, do you love me? The third story, from bewilderment to joy, Cleopas, the two on the road to Emmaus were were walking along and they were telling the story, having heard that Jesus rose from the dead, and they were telling it in a way where they were going, we had hoped that he was the one. Remember them? And, and, and they were kind of recalling the whole life of Jesus. You know, do you remember the teaching? Do you remember the healings? Do you remember all the things that happened? We were really hoping he would be the one to lead Israel back to God. But he obviously wasn't. And another one walked with them. And they talk, and he explains the kingdom to them. And, of course, they go into this home and celebrate communion, and immediately their eyes were open. And they tell the story, didn't our hearts warm together as we walked on the road? And Jesus walked with us, and their eyes were opened that it was him, and he was alive. And they ran back to the disciples in Jerusalem. We met him. From bewilderment to faith, and to hope. Maybe you this morning, like those early disciples, have been praying, Lord, protect me, bless me, help me, when life events conspire against you. And it appears like God's gone AWOL in your life. Have you had times when, you know, you feel like, God, where are you? You're supposed to be here. We had hoped you would heal us. 
We had hoped you would lead us. We had hoped, we had so much hope and you've disappointed us. You've been like that, felt like that. And Jesus, the risen Christ, draws near to you and warms your heart and opens your eyes. What to? To a different story. What, what you thought he was doing, what you wanted him to do, and he's doing something much bigger, much different. A larger story, a different story. And lastly, from unbelief to abandonment. Thomas, Frederick Buchner, when writing of the resurrection, tells how hard it was for the early disciples to believe that Christ had in fact risen. There were no angels in the sky or kings bearing gifts like his birth. He just appeared on a road or in a building or among them. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of unusual to say the most. Or beside a lake or in a room. He came in rather ordinary circumstances, the risen Christ. And many struggled in faith, like Thomas, announcing, as he said, I won't believe unless I can touch his hands and, and, and push my fingers into his side. I will not believe. You see, you been there? Been there? Mm. I'm glad Jesus still carries the marks in his body. Do you know that? Do you know that? In heaven this morning, there's a man in heaven. And he still bears the marks of the cross. Because the resurrected Jesus said to Thomas, come here, put your, put your finger in the hole, you know, test me, it's me. You know, and Thomas goes, yeah, my Lord and my God, falls at his feet. See? Because, because like Thomas, many of us at times struggle to believe in this Jesus, this resurrected, powerful Christ. Why? Because he hasn't done what we asked. <laughs> When we've prayed, he's disappointed us. When we've sought something, he hasn't done it. And we, we kind of struggle with a God who doesn't do what we want. And that Jesus appears to Thomas and says, Thomas, come. Come here. And Thomas believes. I, I guess one of the things that encourages me when I don't believe or I have struggled with faith or disillusioned or disappointed with God. I've been there, have you? Yeah. Is that, is that in heaven this morning, he's there with these marks. He knows what it's like to walk a lonely road. He knows what it's like to be left by the Father, you know? Oh God, you know, you've forsaken me. He knows all those things that we feel and that we go, well, you know, why didn't God turn up for me? Why didn't the Father turn up for Jesus? Right? Same with you happened right there. What strikes me as incredible is that when Jesus resurrected in his resurrected body, he didn't march into Jerusalem before Pilate or the Sanhedrin and say, I'm back. <laughs> I told you. He didn't do it, did he? And neither did he do more miracles of grandiose demonstrations of God-like power. He didn't do that stuff. Now, now that's interesting, isn't it? Think about that. He appeared only to people who believed. And those who struggled, Thomas. In those six weeks, Jesus transformed those early disciples into fearless missional movers. This is the greatest evidence of the resurrection. And down through the centuries, people keep finding the risen Christ alive. People who are grievers who can now hope like Mary. Right? People who are doubters and abandon themselves to his mission like Thomas. People who are disappointed and who find a sense of purpose and joy like the two on the road to Emmaus, clear pass. People who are in despair who find faith and hope for a new future. People who are failures and who find renewal and restoration like Peter. A new start for those people is here because of the resurrection. So today I want to encourage you who know Jesus in your life he can reverse the irreversible. Basically, the resurrection is that atrophy doesn't happen forever, right? Your body's going to die. You will face death. It will happen, but that's not the end. Atrophy and resurrection basically is that 
I'm beyond that. That's the beginning of eternal life. And I want to encourage you that if you're disappointed or disillusioned or perplexed or having kind of doubts about this Jesus, don't, you don't think you're alone. <laughs> Most of the disciples struggled, and they struggled with the risen Jesus in their midst. I mean, hey. Yeah. Let me finish by saying this. This is what the angel said to those who found the risen Christ. Come, see where he lay, and then go and tell he's risen from the dead. That is the message of the church. That is the message of the resurrection. That is it. That is what we need to do. More than anything else, more than any other plan, we just need to come and see and go and tell. That's it. It's simple. I mean, what is difficult about that? <laughs> you see? And we've made such a, an institutionalized church out of this whole thing. And we've put this stuff and policies and this and that and everything else. You don't need it all. Come and see. Go and tell. Come and see. Go and tell. Come together. Be the family of God. Be the church of God. Encourage your relationship. See what he does. See what he does among you. And then go and tell. Go and tell others. Be generous. Go and tell the message of Jesus. It is very, very simple. The Holy Spirit is going to come and live in every one of us. Let me illustrate it this way, and I close with this rather unusual illustration. It'll make the point. I'm a really bad golfer. I, I can play golf. Every now and then I hit the ball. And do you know, in a, if you have a round of golf, you know that there's one or two shots you go, I could really do this, you know. I could, you know, like you hit, a, hit one and it just goes straight up and it lands where you want it to. And you think, I, I, I think I've got this nailed. I really think I've got this nailed. And then you have another shot. No, you know, I haven't. No, I haven't got anything nailed. That was an absolute aberration, a fluke. Now, listen to this. How, what would happen if I was able to get the ability and the experience and the knowledge of a famous golfer inside me? All right? So that instead of Lloyd Ashworth standing up at the tee with it, by the way, it'd be good to have a golf club here at this point in time, uh, standing up at the tee and teeing off, you know, I had someone like Jack Nicklaus or someone, and he was able to live inside me, and he was able to bring his experience to me that when I hit the ball, it was Jack hitting it. It was not me, it was him. And every shot I hit was a winner. It's just like that. Jesus lives in you. He brings his knowledge and his experience and his love and his life in you, and he changes you from the inside out, and he enables you to be a resurrected person from now. Yes, your body atrophies, one day it's going to die, bits of you will fall off and bits won't last, but one day you will be resurrected to new life, and that's the hope, and that's why I led, read Larry's last final fumbles with the pen, because that's what it's like to die, <laughs> and to die well if there is such a thing. <laughs> See? And that's the resurrection. Do I become instantly perfect? No, I don't. Do I start to live? Well, I do. But it's a new kind of life from the inside out. And friends, that is the great news of Easter. I, I planted some grass seed a couple of weeks ago. I've planted a new lawn in my front of my property. And uh, I threw a whole lot of grass seed down, and I watered it, and then, how do you keep those birds away? No, anyway, that's another story. Anyway, and, and nothing happened. I got up the next morning, nothing, just nothing there, not nothing. And I got up the day later, nothing, nothing going on. What has happened to the, my grass? The next day, the birds came, and they started to go, I thought, that's the end of my grass seed. That's useless. So much for that, I better go and get some more. But I waited, and I watered, and I rolled it, and I kind of just, you know, waited... And then I saw something go, Choo! I saw one, one miserable little grass seed poked his head up. And I thought, I've got one, I've got one. And then another one and another one. And it wasn't long before all this new life started sprouting up. Now, Jesus said, if you've got faith, uh, the seed of what? A mustard seed, which is the smallest seed, much smaller than one grass seed, you can move a mountain. 
And friends, when you say yes to Jesus and when you ask him into your life to make his resurrection come from inside out, all right, it's like planting that grass seed. Nothing happens. The morning you, next morning you wake up, you shave the same face if you're a guy. All right? And, and, you know, and you go, nothing's happened. I can't see any sign that I'm a new person in Christ. Well, just wait. Because the next day, still nothing. But slowly, slowly, the life of Jesus begins to grow inside you. And it grows out. And it grows out. And the more you feed it, the more it grows out. And the resurrection power isn't something that just goes overnight, everything's done. The resurrection power of Jesus is slow, steady, powerful, and lasts forever. He is risen. He's risen indeed. That is the resurrection story of Easter Sunday. And friends, all we need to do is say, yes, Lord, you're coming back for me. Grow your life in me. It's a very simple prayer. There's nothing complicated about this. A single sprout and then more and more. And the more you feed it, the more it grows. Friends, this morning, you may be like Mary, grieving, but there's hope. You may be like Thomas, doubting and struggling and disappointed until you meet Jesus and you sense he calls your name and he he goes, come, touch, feel, this this is me, I'm alive. And you go, yeah, Lord. You may be like Peter with a history of failure and desertion and disappointment and you may be a secret disciple that's run away and say, look, I just don't understand. I don't know. God doesn't know. He's coming for you. He came for Peter. He came for him alone, friends. And out on the boat there, he calls his name, and Peter swims the shore and says, God, come on. You can do this with the new life inside. All the resurrection stories, the clear path. We had hoped he was the one. He is the one. Our hearts were warmed. Our eyes were opened, and we've seen him. Father God, thank you this morning for this great story. Thank you that we need to simply come to you in simple, seed-like faith and say, he's Lord. And you begin to grow something inside us. And through faith, we simply say and declare today he's risen. The risen Christ is among his people. Help us, Lord, to figure out how to celebrate this, what to do with this. Help us, Lord, to to figure out ways together as a family that we can, we can allow your Holy Spirit to inspire us from within. And thank you, thank you, thank you that today as we take the bread and the cup, we're together demonstrating not just the death, but the life of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, We're going to celebrate and take communion now. Jane's going to play something. No, he's not. (laughs) Jasper's going to play. And we're just going to take the cup and the bread very simply. And as you take that cup and bread today, you're saying, thank you, Lord God. Thank you, risen Jesus. Thank you that you came for me. Thank you that you speak my name. Thank you that you let me see you as risen. Thank you, thank you. And then we'll finish with a song, okay? So the communion is just flowing on from this message this morning. So come from wherever you are and take the bread. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this very simple memory. The bread, the symbol of Jesus on the cross, the body given over to the Father. The cup, the symbol of the spilt blood of Jesus, that it was this how much as he loves. This is how far I will go to reach down into your life, to win you back, to encourage you, to inspire you for a purpose-filled life. This is how much. There's no length I won't go to for you. Speak our names this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come? Would you come and just take the bread and cup and take it back to your seat and then quietly in your own prayer, respond to the Holy Spirit and what he's saying to you. Some of you that are frustrated or disappointed or perplexed, this is the very best moment
to reach out in faith, right? <laughs> Some of you that are feeling, you know, that you've disappointed or deserted God and let him down and, and you're a Peter at heart, you know, this is the best moment to take the bread and cup. <laughs> Some of you that are grieving for a life that you might have once had that you never got. And you go, God, why, where, where, where were you when, I, when you planned my life? You know, This is the best moment to exercise that simple seed of faith. Thank you. I don't understand. Thank you. There's a larger story. There's a something bigger that you're doing in my life. It's not about what I want or what I need. It's about who you are and what you're doing. All right? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Maybe this is a good day for you also to come to Jesus for the first time and plant that seed. Lord God, I give you my life as a seed. I plant it in the ground. Will you grow it? Grow it from the inside out. Make it strong. Help me to be a disciple of you. Help me to stand up and be strong for you in my place of work, in study, in my home life. I need your power to do that. I pray this in Jesus' name today. done that? That was very quick. Well, we're going to finish how we started. <laughs> I just feel like today is a day to dance and to celebrate. He's risen. Amen. So come on, music team. We need you to move Jasper onto your guitar, and we're going to finish the service by singing the two songs we started with, which is He's Risen He's risen, and then who moved the stone? Yeah. So stand up and celebrate. And then we'll, then we'll finish eventually. If you haven't danced in church, this would be a good morning to do that. Um, and uh, the music team do not need any more encouragement. These are great songs to play, but the message of them is even better. All right. You're doing a new song called Tuning. <laughs> Tuning? Yeah. Sorry. It's all right. All right.
give it. I've been set free. Free start and sleep to five. My good is in me by the The stones be rolling away. And I am free. The stones be rolling Okay, your homework next week, read the whole book of Romans, all right? The whole book, all the chapters, I think there's 16 or something chapters, read it in the good news or the message version, all right? Something easy to read, can be a bit heavy otherwise, but that's your message, that's your homework. And uh, next week we're going to look at the essential message of the book of Romans. Now the other thing I just wanted to say, I knew what it was, there was one more thing, I think hopefully the COVID days are past us, all right? Hopefully. And we're, we're back on deck and we're coming every Sunday at 10 o'clock. So we want the church to build and gain momentum. We want to grow ourselves. We want to kind of, you know, like it's been, what has it been? It's been six or eight months of, you know, are we meeting, are we not? Are we the two services, are we on, are we at home? Or where, where are we, you know? I mean, at least we're back now growing. We're now back week by week. Praise God, that's good, all right? So it's time... It's time to kind of grow and to kind of develop our relationships and to get back on track. So invite your friends. If you know of anybody who's, you know, COVID has messed up, they're not going to church anymore or whatever, give them a call and say, come on, come with me next Sunday because we need to get back in the routine of worshipping together. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next.